Hello everyone and welcome to character generation for our game of Dice Mice. Now ideally you've already looked through the other video, gotten an idea of the setting a little bit or discuss things in the Discord to figure out where your house seat is going to be and maybe an idea of your house words or what the name of your house is going to be. But once you've got that sorted and we have a place to start, this is what you're going to be using to generate our characters. Now there is also a character builder which we might be using uh, that simplifies all of this, makes it less button clicks, and uh, makes it a little bit more user friendly. But if you're using it on pen and paper or uh, just for starting off with the campaign to understand how everything works, we're going to do this the, uh, the, the manual way. So we have our grid and we have our ability to get started. So let's start filling things out. Uh, first thing we would be looking at is filling out our player name, our house name, our house seat, which is going to be in the sticks. I decided that I wanted to, to play some wisdom based characters. And that means the first three mice, one, two, and three, have to be from our house seat. This is where the majority of your house is. So the majority of your mice needs to always be from wherever your house seat is. Your other two mice, mouse four and mouse five, can come from other regions. They just can't come from the same different region. So you can't have two characters from the Warrens or two Two characters from Waste Watch, for example. Uh, so I picked one from Warrens and one from Waste Watch. Now these yellow bars is the associated skill or the associated stat that goes with uh, the individual regions. And these mice will get to roll 46 for the yellow ones, and for all the others, we'll be rolling 3d6. So the 46 keep the best three, and 3d6 for the rest. Now, when we get to this point, we will be using either the character generator or we will be loading up roll 20 and hitting a macro, <coughs> which gives us a big block of text that uh, can tell us here are all of our mice, here's all of our entries. And so we have done that with our next step. So generating a block of mice gives us these results and we put them in order. Everything in this is going to go in order. Our 46 rolls, so 46 keep the highest three, um, went in order on the sheet here, as you can see. And then this giant block fills out the rest of the grid and you can put in your bonuses for your different stats for all of the different mice included. So now that we have a good grid, we know where all these mice are, we can now look and see what class classes these mice qualify for. So taking all of that information, we can go down here using this grid to see what things our mice qualify for. So for example, our mouse number one here, uh, they need on this grid to have a 13 or better in these stats in order to qualify for these classes. The classes that are in bold that are here are only a single stat. So the fighter only needs strength, the wizard only needs intelligence, the warlord only needs charisma. The ones that are not in bold need multiple things. So for example, our first character here has a 14 in strength, so they automatically are a fighter, but they also have a 16 wisdom. So strength and wisdom together, or wisdom and strength together, um, give you the warden class. So they will qualify for fighter, wizard and druid because they have those three at 13 and then they will also qualify for warden and alchemist and when we fill out the rest of the group we get an idea of what sort of our, our list of things that we can do and the reason that you do this all at once is because you'll usually have the option between several different classes, but you might notice that uh, there is sort of a, a heavy lean towards different things. For example, if if we wanted to play as a warden, our mouse one and mouse four could be wardens, um, whereas the uh, mouse five, if we wanted to play a barbarian, we had to be the mouse five to be a barbarian. This is the only one that could qualify for barbarian, as well as warlord and exemplar. So I went ahead and picked the classes, the bold ones here, I did want to use my wisdom somewhat because I was rolling as a wisdom house. And so I picked alchemist and scout as both classes that require wisdom to function. Our scout is our dex whiz class and our alchemist is our int whiz class. Uh, and these choices are mainly, mainly on vibes. Now you can, if you so choose, open up the player guide, go to your different classes and read the full entry for each class that is available to you. Um, I'm not going to say it's not recommended, but it is a lot of extra work to do that. There is at the beginning of the class entry also the characters at a glance. So if you want to see what a barbarian does, you can look and it'll show you this is uh, how it feels to play a barbarian. Keep in mind that 
we are going to be having a stable of characters here. You're not picking the one class that you want to play for the entire campaign. You're picking the classes that you're going to have access to in your stable of characters when you go off an adventure. So you do want to mix and match get, you know, you don't want to have three fighters, although you could with this array have three fighters. Um, now we pick our best three, we assign them classes, and then we're gonna go ahead and go down here and do a little bit more work. When we assign our classes, uh, another way to look at it when we have the builder is that the builder will show us uh, a grid of how our classes uh, line up. So you can see, oh, I don't have any, I can't be a bard or a brawler or a sorcerer, but I have access to every other class. Um, and you can see, all right, well, Poor, poor mouse number two and mouse number three, they only have two or one class option, whereas our, our mouse four is, is a gifted and talented character. It can qualify for quite a few different things. So once we get this all situated and set up, uh, we will do two things, one of which is figuring out what to do with our retainers. Retainers are characters that are associated with your house that you can take out adventuring if you have characters with the leadership trait. And these retainers can really help do a bunch of things, but they are not adventuring characters. These are um, ones that are support characters. These are characters that uh, you are going to be bringing out in support of adventures. So one of the things that you do with them is you go ahead and give them a single hit point. They have one health. They do not have any character traits because we're not gonna be playing them like characters. And then you're gonna lower any adventuring stats that they have. Any stat that is 13 or higher, because that, that's what you need to qualify for a class, is 13 or higher. So all their stats that allow them to qualify, you lower those to 12. So our mouse number three here, they had a 15 strength, that was lowered to 12. They had, and then mouse number two had a 13 constitution and a 13 intelligence. So we lowered those to 12. So our retainers are done. We'll have these as retainers for the house that can come with our mice. And we might be able to, especially at higher uh, house rank, we might be able to rent these these characters out to go on adventure to get something from our, our non-adventuring, our support mice. And then for our uh, mouse, uh, for our mice, one, four, and five, we went ahead and put in their class and then use their class entry uh, using a macro in roll 20 to roll for hit points. Now, the way that hit points function is each class has a specific uh, hit point that they're uh, using. So for example, a bard would be 1d6. And when they roll for hit points, they cannot score lower than their constitution modifier. So um, both our mouse one and mouse four have relatively low constitutions, a negative two and only a plus one. Um, but that would mean that if our, if our mouse number four, if they rolled a one for their constitution or for their hit points because of their constitution, they would be able to re-roll. Unfortunately, they rolled a two. And then uh, for our mouse number five here, they have a plus two mod. So that means if they roll a one or a two using their 12 sided for their, uh, their hit points to start with, they would be able to re-roll those until they rolled something higher. You can roll 11 twos in a row. You'll keep whatever you roll that rolls higher than a two. Now, this very bottom part, this character trait, this is something that is going to kind of give you an idea of who this person is. And this is something you can leave blank until you start playing. You can put something in here as a placeholder. Uh, I kind of thought that this character, who would be an alchemist dealing with poisons and hazardous chemicals, but they've got a very low constitution and they're a little clumsy. They've got low dexterity. So they might be kind of anxious. They might be accident prone. Uh, so that is what I assigned for them. Uh, by contrast, our mouse number four here, he, he or she has a pretty gifted stats in everything but their ability to relate to other people. So this might be the ideal overconfident mouse that's just kind of generically good at everything except for um, being humble and uh, and making it to where other people uh, like being around them. And our mouse number five, they are from the, the Waste Watch. They're from the place where uh, mice that are nimble and fast on their feet are, are very well respected, but they are especially clumsy for someone from the Waste Watch. So uh, I was kind of thinking that with a barbarian, with a good strength and good con, this character might seem more like a, like a bull in the china shop. So I gave them the character trait careful. Now these traits do something during the game. If you can say that you're acting and doing something within your trait, you can use it to apply an aid to yourself. You get a, effectively a plus two to your role. Um, 
And so you can kind of uh, play around with this a little bit, but this is the primary way that when you're, especially when your characters are low level, you're going to be giving some flavor to that character. Now, this is basically done. We've got our, our, our characters and we have just a little bit left to do. We're gonna go into getting some equipment for the characters. Now there is a quick select uh, area on the builder as well as on the basic rules that players have access to. But the key thing here is Everyone just go ahead and has an adventuring kit. It has some basic stuff in it. And the idea here is as members of the noble families of these mice, you have basic equipment. You don't need to worry about uh, keeping track of making sure you have enough rations and things like that, unless you use more than normal. And while you have three days worth of rations on you by default, if your character believes that they're gonna be away from uh, the sticks for several days or they have a reason to get extra food. You can get extra stuff from your house. You just have to explain it. You have to justify it to your dungeon master. A lot of the basics of things like rope and food and water um, are going to be handy. That's not something that we're, we're interested in keeping track of in this system as far as uh, specific numbers are concerned, unless it becomes relevant of you only have one water skin. If you get to a situation where having only one water skin is very relevant, then it'll be uh, a mechanic when we get to that point, rather than having you track things in case it becomes relevant. Um, the next thing is picking whether you want a shield. So I looked at our three characters, our alchemist, our scout, and our barbarian, and I just looked at what their strength and con is. On the handouts that show you shields and weapons, uh, you can see basically how effective uh, the buckler, light shield, and heavy shield are. Uh, you don't really need to worry about this. It'll, it'll all make sense through play, but the short version is the lower your strength is, the more effort it takes to protect yourself with your shield, and the lower where your constitution is, the more having a shield drags on you, the more difficult it is for you to move around as normal, uh, carrying this, this heavy shield with you everywhere you go. So uh, I went through and looked at our alchemist who had good strength and bad con, so I didn't pick them up a shield. Uh, and then I wanted to get them a weapon. Since they weren't using a shield, I went ahead and picked a two-handed weapon. They qualify for a halberd, so they have uh, enough strength. They need 13 strength in order to uh, be able to use a halberd effectively. And uh, I thought that would be a good good starting weapon for our, for our alchemist. And they also have a bow. So I think they're gonna, with their very low uh, dexterity and low constitution, they're gonna try to stay at range if they can. And the bow has the heavy property. So the heavy property means that um, they can use their strength instead of their very poor dexterity as a ranged option. Our scout uh, gets has good strength and okay constitution, so I went ahead and hooked them up with a buckler as that's not going to, to lower their speed, and I want our, our scout to be speedy and gave them a sword and a crossbow. And uh, lastly, our barbarian has good strength and good con, uh, so they suffer basically no penalties for using a light shield uh, and picked them up a warhammer and sword so they have some good options of different damage types. The Warhammer can give them bludgeoning and the sword slashing and piercing, and then the throwing axe as a ranged option that will also use our Barbarian's uh, excellent strength to get things done. Now, you'll also notice that uh, our Scout and our Barbarian, they start with a po potion of heroism because they are not a caster class, and our Alchemist, because they are around potions a lot, they start with two potions of heroism. These are, these are potions that grant the user temporary hit points. And once we've got our stats, we've got our equipment ready, we need to go on to what's next. And at this point, what I would do is I would assign in roll 20 your uh, character to have some of the journals for the different classes that have some of the default class stuff in them, uh, including a bunch of like weapons and armor and things like that, and the, the base mice uh, class journal will also have all of the different weapons and armors and things. So the idea here is that you will need to do very little uh, programming or making of macros. Most of what you're going to be doing is deleting the sections of stuff that you're not using. Um, 
And once you've got that done, you're, you're good to play. You're good to start. Now, one last thing that you could look at that I would actually recommend you look at between character generation and the first time you play is skills. In the, uh, in the rules that you'll get that are the player facing rules, uh, all the class information is in there as well. But for your skills, um, there are some specific rules on kind of what you can do and what you're going to be good at. Now, each class will tell you what their class skills are. So for example, uh, let's go to Scout because we have a Scout. They've got Acrobatics, Dungeoneering, Heal, Nature Perception, uh, Stealth, Survival, and Thievery as options. That doesn't mean you're automatically good in all these, although higher level Scouts are going to get automatic ranks in these abilities. But this is the things that you can specialize in at first level. Each class will have a certain number of skill points, and when we go and call for a skill use during play, that is the point where you can decide, I think that my character should be uh, either baseline, so they don't have any uh, bonuses placed into it. They should be better than baseline, so they should have a single skill point placed in. They're going to be skilled in the option. Or if it is something that is associated with their class, you can put two skill points into it and become trained. Being skilled gives you a plus two bonus to that skill. Being trained gives you a plus four bonus, but it also gives you the benefit of a ability. So you can sort of spec into being good at things. Our scout, for example, is likely going to want to be good at perception. It is one of the class skills of scout, and it is also one of the things that kind of defines what being a scout character is. And so you can see being being trained in perception means that you can use your wisdom modifier instead of your dexterity modifier for initiative. And it has other benefits going all the way up to legendary perception, which makes it to where anything that is within 30 inches of you, so one movement of you, they do not get benefit from concealment, even if you can't see them. So if they're even if they're invisible, they get no bonuses to being invisible if you are uh, legendarily perceptive. So you can sort of look at the abilities that are here, figure out if there's something that, that really speaks to you. And what we say for a lot of these characters is each of these characters is written in pencil. That means that if there are things that you choose that you find out you don't like, you can retroactively uh, change them. Even if you decide in session, you know, I want to be a very perceptive character. When you go to level up from level one to level two, you can decide at that moment that you know, I really didn't use perception that much or the way that this character played out, the way that our scout played out, the way that his overconfidence really played out at the table was that he wasn't actually very perceptive. Instead, he was very acrobatic because he was uh, jumping around, jumping headlong into things without a care in the world and specifically wasn't being perceptive. That means that you can take those points away from being trained in perception and put them somewhere else. And the only time that you what we call write in pen where you actually say yes this is how the character functions is when you level up uh, you'll write all the stuff that you did at level one down in pen and you'll gain some new skill points for level two so character generation is pretty quick and easy once we have the character generator uh, fully up and running a lot of this will be able to be done with only a couple of button clicks uh, so for right now we're going to be working with uh, the dm every time Every character is going to sit down with me and we will we'll work through making them a character and giving them uh, journal entries. But uh, ideally here pretty soon, once the campaign gets started, um, when you're rolling up either a couple new mice, because some of your mice are, are have been taken out, have been eaten, or are on downtime doing different things, uh, and you need to roll up a couple new characters, or if someone is rolling up a new house, they will be able to do so all on their own. So I look forward to seeing you uh, at session and getting your characters up and running, and uh, see you soon.